We are Harvard. You, me, and the entire alumni community across the globe. From our first days on campus to the lives we shaped since, we bring Harvard with us wherever we go. And it's our community's dedication and commitment now and through the centuries that has made Harvard what it is today. Our impact in the world is far reaching. From those of us who are teachers, who are nonprofit leaders and community organizers, who have been working on the front lines, to those of us leading companies, cities, and countries, from artists to scientists. Together, our collective impact changes the world. At Harvard, we strive to make sure all members of our community feel like they belong. We support and mentor current and prospective students. We give back by sharing time and knowledge to help make Harvard the best it can be. We are the very heart and foundation of the Harvard community. Just like the alumni who gave it for us. So today, we're here to celebrate our community. No matter where you live and no matter which Harvard school you graduated from. Today, we gather together as one Harvard family. 400,000 strong. Whether you are in Istanbul or anywhere else, we are so glad you're here. Welcome to the annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association. Ayakum Allah fi Multaka Harvard Decennial. Kalos ilfate sti netisia sinandisi tu sindesmu apofito tu Harvard. Kushe kabo una welcome na we Harvard Alumni Association annual meeting. Harvard mezunar dani'nin yillik toplantısına hoş geldiniz. Bienvenidos a la reunión anual del Harvard Alumni Association. Karibu kwenye mkutano wa kila mwaka wa muungano wa wanafunzi waliofuzu chuo cha Harvard. Selamat datang ke Masyarakat Tahunan Harvard Alumni Association. Kwa namna namba tatu, bagana gan usten dela toma. Bienvenue à la réunion annuelle de Harvard Alumni Association. Hello from India. Hello, apa kabar? Hola. Hello from Jakarta. Bonki gogoni lati lukis karwe. Namaste from Bengaluru. Greetings from London. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh from Hudson Valley, New York. Hola todos. Welcome to the group. Hola. Hola a todos. Marhaba. Stockholm. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Welcome to the 151st annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association pre show. My name is Anarima Bargava, and I was elected by the Harvard College class of 1996, celebrating our 25th reunion to be this year's Chief Marshal of Alumni. I am so honored to serve in this role and happy to be part of this year's celebration to honor you, our Harvard alumni. If we were together in Harvard Yard, I would be waving this baton right now and leading us all in the annual alumni parade. Today, we're gonna to honor this tradition a bit differently. I will lead us as we march virtually through this joyous pre-show that will highlight the Harvard alumni community, encompassing Harvard College and 11 graduate and professional schools. Our march will extend from my hometown of Chicago, where I am today, to countless countries across the globe. Every day, our alumni community, 400,000 plus strong, makes a profound difference and impact in our local communities and the world. On this day, we celebrate you. invited eight ninth graders from Highland School District in Washington to come and visit the college and the rest of Harvard University, have a chance to learn a bit more about college and uh, the opportunities available to them. As a mentor, I'm paired up with one of the Crimson Achievement Program scholars, and my job is to guide them for this year and beyond. What's interesting about these students is they're mostly first gen, and so this is their first opportunity to be able to see an amazing opportunity like this. Give your 
from a, a district where the majority of students go to college, that's kind of an expectation. You can kind of just go with the flow. What would it have been like if my parents didn't go to college? It's not as obvious, it's not as clear. And I feel like this mentorship program is like being that older sibling or that guiding parent for students who don't have any of that. A few years ago, I went to my first tech conference, and it was so exciting and energizing and innovative. I knew then I had to do something to democratize opportunity for today's young men of color, and so I founded All Star Code. All Star Code's mission is to create the next generation of tech leaders, and we're doing that by closing the opportunity gap between young men of color and the tech industry. Welcome to the All Star Code Summer Intensive. <laughs> Best in class computer science instruction, industry exposure, mentorships, college guidance, internship placement, and leadership training, which supports their learning, their growth, and their overall success. I live literally two blocks from where Dr. King was assassinated from the National Civil Rights Museum. I just was very frustrated with the fact that we have so many young people who have these big dreams but don't necessarily have the access or the tools to get to where they want to be. And so we started the collective to really build pathways to social mobility and to make sure that our young adults crystallize those dreams but then also the tools and the resources to actually make those dreams come true. We have a, a community dinner, and at our community dinners, each young adult comes with their professional mentors, and those pairs come to the dinners for programming. And so it's a great interactive opportunity for young adults to share their questions, share their scenarios, um, get advice on things that they're really facing, because for many of our young adults, this is their first employment opportunity in their field. And so we really want to make sure that they're both prepared and have the support that they need to thrive. One of the wonderful things about poetry is that it doesn't necessitate that you have to have the answers. And I think when I teach it, I try to emphasize that, that like poetry is a means of, of asking yourself about the world um, and why the world exists the way that it does and why and how you are positioned in the world in the, in the way that you are. And that at the end of the poem, you don't have to have an, an answer to that question. And in, but you might potentially have more questions than you did when you started. And I think writing at its best demands that level of reflection that we like are increasingly uh, having less and less of in our sort of modern 21st century era. Thank you, Sarah, Clint, Alexis, and Christina, and all who join you in service. Your dedication to a better tomorrow, like so many other alumni, is essential to our world today. Alumni have been part of the commencement tradition since 1869. A core group of alumni volunteers aptly named the Happy Observance of Commencement Committee, best known as the Happy Committee, you don't get any better than that, are seen throughout Harvard Yard from 6.30 a.m. until 5 p.m. on com commencement day, wielding their batons. Among their many duties is overseeing the time-honored tradition of the alumni parade. The parade, most notably composed of our Harvard College alumni reunion attendees, is always a highlight of the day and a time-honored tradition. It is led by the Chief Marshal of, of Alumni, that's me, and our eldest alumni in attendance, that's not me. Together, today I am happy to introduce our alumni commentators who will kick off the parade. Nancy Sinsenbaugh, Harvard College class of 1976, who is celebrating her 45th reunion this week. She's also in the business school class of 1978. And William Horton, Harvard College class of 1977. Nancy and Bill, take it away. for introducing us. I'm Nancy Sintabaugh. And I'm Bill Horton. 
and welcome to the 2021 Harvard Alumni Association Annual Alumni Parade. Because of the pandemic, unfortunately last year, we were unable to hold an annual meeting. So we are doubly pleased to be here with you today. The enchantment of this alumni parade brings together Harvard alumni from all schools, all classes, and from around the globe. And this is our very first virtual alumni parade, and we will be talking about this for decades to come. We, in particular, we welcome today our newest alumni from the college and graduate schools of the classes of 2020 and 2021. Bill, I'm so pleased to be with you here again today. And Nancy, it's great to be with you. Usually we're providing our commentary from a perch stage left in Tercentenary Theater with a view much like the one you see beside me or behind me now. But this is just as exciting today. I'm, I'm really enthused that we're able to introduce the alumni parade for our fellow alumni around the world in a little different way. And I think this is part of the excitement and part of the enchantment of what we're able to do is provide this and help alumni feel the sense of the alumni parade. would like to welcome the 14 reunion classes who are with us today, beginning with the great class of 1951, which is celebrating its, wait for it, 70th reunion this week. We're glad to have you all with us today. To our oldest alumni, they share an honored spot in the alumni parade, and they are well represented by the Crimson Society today. And the HAA Crimson Society is the organization of all Harvard College and Radcliffe College alumni starting the year after their 50th reunion. Few people know that Harvard actually invented reunions. At the first commencement in 1642, the college deans invited the elders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony to come to celebrate with the graduates. And so the ministers, the politicians, the governor of the colony, as well as other significant people came to Cambridge in 1642 to celebrate the first commencement. The next year, 1643, the alumni who graduated in 1642 were invited and they came to Cambridge for the first ever college reunion. And so all the college reunions across colleges and universities around the world have followed that tradition. Harvard Alumni Association has over 400,000 members from every state in the union and more than 180 countries worldwide. Students come to Harvard for a year, two or seven, depending on their degree program, and then they are alumni for the rest of their lives. As we say at the HAA, there are no dues and no escape from this global community of Harvard alumni. While we mentioned today the many milestone reunions, and reunion years for college graduates, we welcome all university graduates today to the ranks of Harvard alumni. One of the great things about being a graduate of Harvard is there is literally a worldwide network of people for you to be involved with. And as we say, the sun never sets on Harvard. Nancy, that's a beautiful top hat you're wearing today. And we see many of them in the previous, or the photos of previous alumni parades. What's the significance of top hats on commencement day and for the alumni parade? Well, Bill, you know, you and I are both members of the Happy Observance of Commencement Committee, otherwise known as the Happy Committee. And I have to say, when I first heard about the Happy Committee, I said, I have to be on any committee that's called Happy. 
It was started in 1869 to bring alumni back to uh, commencement, but also to have alumni volunteers help with uh, crowd uh, control, with giving people directions, with making sure people knew where to go. As the alumni parade draws to a close, Nancy, I feel it's the right time for an alumni parade tradition and for you to invoke the words of Seamus Haney, former Harvard Boylston professor of rhetoric and oratory, which he wrote for Harvard's 350th commencement in 1986. Thank you, Bill. The poem is entitled, John Harvard Walks the Yard. A spirit moved, John Harvard walked the yard. The atom lay unsplit, the west unwon. The book stood open and the gates unbarred. The maps dreamt on like moon dust, nothing stirred. The future was a verb in hibernation. A spirit moved, John Harvard walked the yard. Before the classic style, before the clabbered, all through the small hours of an origin, the book stood open and the gate unbarred. Night passage of a migratory bird, wing flap, gown flap, like a homing pigeon, a spirit moved, John Harvard walked the yard. Was that his soul, look, sped to its reward, by grace or works, a shooting star, an omen? The book stood open and the gate unbarred. Begin again where frosts and tests were hard. Find yourself or founder. Here, imagine a spirit moves. John Harvard walks the yard. The book stand open and the gates unbarred. Well, thank you, Nancy. I always appreciate hearing it and especially hearing it with your voice. And with those insightful thoughts from Shane Haney, we bid you farewell and thank you for being our guest today. Thank you for joining us today for the pre-show to the 151st annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association. On behalf of the Harvard Alumni Association and your fellow alumni volunteers and members, thank you for all you do as members of the Harvard community. Welcome to the 151st annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association. Although we are not all together in person this year, I want to extend a warm welcome to President Bacow, members of the Harvard Governing Boards, Mr. Kevin Young, members of the HAA Board of Directors, volunteers and alumni from around the globe, almost 400,000 of you, our newest graduates from the class of 2021, and all members of the Harvard community. My name is John West, I'm a member of the Harvard Business School class of 1995. As the president of the Harvard Alumni Association, and in accordance with the tradition set by our very first Alumni Association president, John Quincy Adams, class of 1787, I raise this gavel and call this meeting to order. Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Massachusetts tribe. Our university honors the historic Harvard Charter of 1650, which committed our institution to, and I quote, the education of English and Indian youth of this country. As a chartered creation of the Massachusetts colonies and the Commonwealth, Harvard evolved alongside the persistence of Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag nations. 
Located near the Charles River, this place has long served as a site of meeting, exchanges, diplomacy among nations, with thousands of contemporary Native American people living in greater Boston and tens of thousands in the state of Massachusetts. As a world-class university situated on these lands, we are dedicated to building a vibrant partnership with Native American communities, promoting innovative scholarships on Native American issues, and cultivating distinguished achievements by Native American students. How does one possibly summarize this past year? Such global tragedy that touched each one of us personally. So many stories of loss. In a matter of days in early 2020, our lives and world turned upside down and inside out. My theme as president this past year has been that we, the Harvard alumni, are one community around the world. One of the greatest honors of my life was to learn two years ago that I was selected to be the president of the Harvard Alumni Association. As an incoming president, you're asked to define a theme for your year. I wanted to build upon the work started by former President Drew Faust to unite the college, Radcliffe, and the 11 graduate schools as one Harvard. This was personally meaningful to me as I graduated from the Harvard Business School, but not the college. Beyond that, I was inspired by President Bacow's early perspective that Harvard and our alumni have a greater role in the world beyond ourselves. So in late 2019, I landed on the theme, One Community, to define my year as president. Little did I know how relevant that would be as we enter 2020. The potential collective power of Harvard's 400,000 global alumni is such an awesome opportunity and responsibility. Not power in a self-serving and controlling sense, quite the opposite. The power to create positive impact, to do good, to drive change in the world. All of the work we have collectively done on the HAA board this year is aligned to that theme. Our anti-racism initiative, our public narrative projects, our focus on understanding the divisive nature of our society today. Everything we have done has been intended to empower and connect Harvard's global alumni community and create good and positive impact in the world, which is so very needed these days. My favorite song from a U2 album called Songs of Experience, released in 2017, is called Love is Bigger Than Anything in Its Way. The lyrics and messages are so very beautiful and powerful. I have seen them play out this year as we all came to terms with our collective humanity. I have seen them time and again across our Harvard alumni community and how we supported our students, our faculty, our administration, and our fellow alumni. Moreover, how we also supported our friends, family, and strangers. How we supported our local communities. As we emerge through the portal of this pandemic, my greatest hope is that we don't forget what we have learned this past year about what is really important in life. I hope we expand on the positive changes we can continue to make as Harvard alumni and as engaged citizens in our world. Thank you, John, and thank you for all you have done as our first virtual president. I could not think of a better person to lead us through this year. And thank you, President Bacow and Kevin Young for taking time from your busy schedules to address our alumni community today. To all of you, I extend a very warm welcome to the annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association. Shortly, you will hear from our Chief Marshal, Anarima Bargava. At a recent HAA program, she shared that, for her, the gift of Harvard is community. That statement resonated deeply with me. And today, I want to thank all of you, especially the thousands of alumni volunteers who work so hard to nurture and grow that gift. The community of Harvard alumni spans the globe in generations. As John says, it is one community, albeit with many voices and many perspectives. And its beauty is in its diversity of opinions, life experiences, and thought. As alumni, you listen and work to understand all the voices in our community and to celebrate them. We have seen so many of our alumni volunteers build this sense of community in countless ways including our clubs and shared interest group leadership, graduate school councils, and college class committees, and of course, the Alumni Association Board. Your fellow alumni have brought people together for programming on the climate crisis and for education and dialogue around anti-racism. They have worked to encourage alumni to have a voice in the university's governance through voting in Harvard's elections for board of overseers and elected directors of the association. 
We have seen thoughtful programming in our college reunion classes on the topical issues of the day, bringing their classmates together to learn and discuss as they celebrate their virtual reunions. And of course, groups have come together just to connect and have fun, including dance parties on Zoom. We've seen alumni mobilizing to buttress democracy, to give voice to underrepresented groups of alumni and fellow citizens, to empower women around the world, support entrepreneurs, and so much more. Daily, we learn of the efforts by alumni and of alumni to advocate for and create a better world. I want to thank all the alumni who volunteer their time in myriad ways to nurture this gift of community. You all inspire me, and I hope you feel that the tireless work you do for your fellow alumni and for Harvard not only provides community for your friends and classmates, but also has the potential to have a profound impact on our world. Thank you. Thank you for all you do for Harvard, for one another, and for the world. Hello, fellow alumni, and a special warm welcome to the newest members of our alumni community from the class of 2021. I'm so excited to be here as the incoming president of the Harvard Alumni Association. It's been 25 years since I attended my first annual meeting of the HAA. At that point, I must confess that I didn't yet appreciate what it meant to join this lifelong intergenerational and global community of over 400,000 alumni. I assumed that the chapter of connecting meaningfully with other people at Harvard was behind me. I was enthralled by the prospect of going out into the world, literally. Upon graduation, my next stop was the Netherlands for Fulbright, but I considered it a journey to take on my own. As I began to establish roots in the Netherlands, I felt adrift. So I reached out to the Harvard Club of the Netherlands and found a home. When I moved to the UK a few years later, I did the same thing with the Harvard Club of the UK, where I was not only welcomed over afternoon tea with alumni, but I also started interviewing students for the college. When I moved back to New York and started my journey as an entrepreneur, I celebrated and commiserated on the ups and downs of being a founder with so many folks while starting the New York chapter for Harvard alumni entrepreneurs, one of about 60 shared interest groups you can join. I've had many roles at the HAA since, and it's the most rewarding volunteer work I do. It keeps giving so much more than the time I put in. Over the last months, as videos of elderly Asians being attacked surfaced, followed by the Atlanta shootings of Asian women, I shared on social media some of the painful personal experiences I had growing up Chinese American, including how my mother was jumped a few years ago by a group of youth and slammed against the concrete. The next thing I knew, I got emails from the Harvard clubs of Ireland and Boston, asking if they could host an allyship event to show support for the AAPI community. We ended up with a Zoom of over 65 Harvard clubs showing alumni how to take action as allies. It's empowering to think not only of the love, but the change and impact this alumni community can bring. Just imagine what else we can do if we come together more often. We can only be one Harvard if we are inclusive and take action for one another. And that is my theme for next year as incoming president of the HAA. In this day and age of increasing polarization, I ask you to tap into this resource of 400,000 alumni behind you. This is the legacy John Quincy Adams had in mind when he formed the HAA and became its first president. One such person who has been continually tapping and inspiring fellow alumni is our next speaker. She has been fighting for marginalized and underserved groups throughout her career, leads Anthem of Us, and is the chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. I'm thrilled to introduce my dear friend, fellow Institute of Politics buddy, and classmate from the amazing class of 1996, our 25th reunion Chief Marshal, Anurima Bhargava.
I am so honored to have been chosen as Chief Marshal of our 25th Reunion College class to represent the magic and light of the fierce and beautiful Harvard class of 1996. I have never been one to underestimate our class, but I dare say none of us could have imagined that 25 years after we graduated, this would be our year. A year of multiple pandemics that illustrated how power and privilege are mapped and scored across the world and mark who is rendered worthy and who is rendered invisible. A year that provided an X-ray of where the bones of our societies and nations are broken, where the tissues that bind and connect us have worn away and where the wounds deepen and linger. A year that reminded us that diversity, equity, and inclusion are essential, yet just the beginnings of what we need to sustain dignity, justice, and a sense of belonging, and to heal traumas and bridge the racial, religious, and economic divides. A year that showed us that we can be as proximate to someone across the world as we are to someone down the street. And perhaps most of all, a year where we understood the value and blessings of community. For me, the gift of Harvard is community. A lifelong community forged long ago when we introduced ourselves to one another and started our wanderings. Over the years, our Harvard community has been an anchor and a port from which we could chart uncommon journeys, adventure and get lost, and stretch across boundaries. It is a community that evolved, albeit slowly, past the professions, the titles, and the achievements that we can see and measure. Now it lives and transforms with us and grows more personal. A community where we can share vulnerabilities and challenges and learn that we need not feel alone in our fears or in our joys where we can begin to understand the mental health struggles that are the daily companion of so many, or the isolation, tokenism, and targeting experienced by our classmates in the class of 1996 that had the lowest black student enrollment in years. Where, as my classmates have exemplified this reunion year in podcast conversations with one another, we can fill in histories, indulge curiosities, honor and build traditions, and break and defy stereotypes. We, are a community grounded in purpose, who serves and creates together, from building organizations to educate street children in Kenya, to knocking on doors and gathering virtually to write postcards, to telling stories and making documentaries that give voice to the silenced. We learn from one another about the many forms and shapes service can take and inspire each other to join in. And we are a community of presence and support that shows up on doorsteps and dance floors in times of loss, reminds us to have faith in each other and ourselves and ennobles our spirit. A community to enrich the soil we grow in that gifts us little wisdoms and songs and recipes and happinesses and honors the great and more importantly, the good in us. Our lifelong Harvard community where we started our journeys and can reignite and continue them anew. Where we can anchor and sustain one another in these times where the ground keeps shifting and know that no matter where we stand, we share the same soil. I am most grateful for this gift. Thank you. Each year at commencement, we recognize the winners of the Harvard Medal. Created in 1981, the Harvard Medal is one of the highest honors awarded by the university and recognizes individuals who've given extraordinary service to this institution. Today, we are honoring our 2020 and 2021 recipients, each of whom merits this recognition for their exemplary and inspirational commitment to our university. I'll begin with our 2020 recipients. David L. Evans, a trusted advisor, determined advocate, and faithful friend You've embodied Harvard's mission of inclusive excellence, blazing a trail as an admissions officer through your tenacious efforts to build a more diverse college, ensuring students from all backgrounds were welcomed into each class you helped select, and ushering in future changemakers for half a century. David, on behalf of countless Harvard students who owe their Harvard education to you, Thank you for all that you've done for them and for Harvard. 
President Bacow, thank you very much. I am profoundly grateful. I am the son of black sharecroppers from Phillips County, Arkansas. My mother had a sixth grade education. My father never went to school. They had seven children. I'm the fourth of seven. They both died before I was 16 and a half years old. Yet all seven of the children went to college. This left a, a very powerful influence on me. If God blessed you with good fortune, you owed that forward to someone else. I came in to work at Harvard in the spring of 1970, thinking that I was going to be there for two years, and I stayed there 50 years. In the half century that I worked in the admissions office, almost 7,000 African-Americans were admitted to Harvard and Radcliffe, before fewer than 300. So I'm not going to say that I ever did that by myself. No one does, but I was present. And I go away from my years very, very, very fulfilled. You don't just go and make the chain of life in one day or two. You build a link and you make sure that link is securely connected to another link and you will eventually build a chain. I believe very strongly that receiving the Harvard Medal is as symbolic as it is tangible especially for one from my background. I'm uncomfortable saying this, but mine is a pretty significant American story. And the Harvard Medal recognizes that. And I am very, very hopeful that in so doing, others of similar backgrounds will be inspired in one lifetime, and that is mine, to go from a sharecropper shack in rural Arkansas to the Harvard Medal that's almost unimaginable. Thank you very, very much. Layla T. Fawaz, a towering scholar of history and the humanities with boundless curiosity and a remarkable ability to bring people together. You've bolstered connections among members of the Harvard community in the Middle East and around the world, leading by example, nurturing consensus and building bridges across cultural and geographic and disciplinary boundaries. Congratulations, Layla, for being a wonderful friend to this institution and to so many of us. Thank you for your service to the university. Thank you again very much. The Harvard Medal came completely unexpected to me. When I got the phone call, I was so happy. I was so overwhelmed. Really, it was one of the biggest surprises I've ever had. There were a lot of pleasures on the way because I was six years on the board. And before that, I spent years working with Harvard. And before that, I was a student at Harvard. So I've had a life with Harvard, but this was really very special. I came originally from an international background. I was born in Africa, but I grew up in Lebanon. And then we came to America, my husband and I, most of our lives, we've been here. We came to study thinking that we came for three years and spent a lifetime here. I wouldn't move now anywhere. The friends that you make along the way, they stay. This has been a very special pleasure and honor. It's one of the great events of my life. I'm still very touched by it, and it has an emotional meaning to me that I will never lose. So thank you for creating this extraordinary pleasure and for making me feel part of the true Harvard family. Thank you so much. Joseph J. O'Donnell, celebrated widely as a Harvard treasure for your down-to-earth leadership and inspiring commitment to philanthropy and service, You've cultivated lasting relationships across all parts of the university and among community partners, continually spurring Harvard to be better with your wise counsel, your invaluable insight, and your steadfast resolve to provide every student with the means to succeed. Congratulations, Joe. It's an enormous privilege to stand here and present this medal to you on behalf of the university. I want to say thank you, Larry Bacow. I'm very honored to receive this award, but I have to make it really clear that I've gotten back from the university much more than I've been able to give. The reason I do is I'm giving back to people who gave people like me the opportunity to fulfill their potential. I've been at Harvard my whole life. I started my first year at Harvard, I was 18 years old. At this point in time, I'm 60 years into it. 
and I've always appreciated the people behind the institution. Think about everything that's changed at Harvard. When I started at, at Harvard College, it was 76% of the students were private schools. So it was a different world then than it is now. I mean, I realized that I was an original first generation kid. As soon as I settled in with that freshman class, there's a life lesson to learn that it doesn't matter what kind of background you come from in terms of who you are as a person and how you can make a difference in the world. I think the school has become much more representative of the world. And now with leading the national charge for equality in so many different ways, I've spent a lot of time and resources, it isn't just money, it's time, it's involvement, it's caring, it's getting other people involved. So it's a whole myriad of things that I feel very good about making a difference. And particularly since when I first came here, I was in a distinct minority. I am honored to, to receive this award and deeply appreciative. Thank you. Congratulations to all our 2020 Harvard medalists. And now I have the honor of recognizing our 2021 Harvard medalists. Walter Clare, a profoundly dedicated leader, deeply respected mentor, and true university citizen, whose warmth and heartfelt kindness radiates from Nashville to Cambridge. He fostered collaboration across schools and a lifelong engagement among our alumni, strengthening the quality of education at Harvard inspiring young scholars to pursue and improve the practice of medicine and expanding opportunities for all students. Congratulations, Walter, on this richly deserved honor. Thank you for all you've done for all of us. It first is an honor, and I'd like to thank both presidents, both President Bacow and President John West of the Alumni Association. It has a lot of meaning to me personally, but I think in addition to that, I have to say it has a lot of meaning to my family because over the years, I've used the lessons learned from my experience at Harvard and my experience working with Harvard to try to be a role model for my two sons. The greatest gift that I have received from Harvard was the opportunity to have met my wife, my life partner. So for me, this was a wonderful, wonderful affirmation that though I never sought particular recognition of it, that people did recognize that some of the things that were important to me in my life were also considered important to the university. I had recently planned to go into semi-retirement and because of all of the things that have happened in this era of pandemic and social justice, I've shifted my career a bit, but it includes a considerable amount of service and mentoring, trying to encourage the next several generations of people to do the things that will make this a better society. I'm really happy that receiving this award has reminded me and my family that the work that we've been trying to do collectively is honored and recognized because really this is not an award that should be thought of as an award to Walter Clare. It should be thought of as an award to Walter Clare and his family. It's quite an honor. I'm humbled and appreciative. Thank you, Harvard University. Nancy Beth Gordon Shear. Over decades of unwavering service, you've demonstrated visionary leadership and extraordinary devotion to the university helping to orchestrate the successful merger of Radcliffe and Harvard, supporting the creation of the Radcliffe Institute as an unrivaled space for multidisciplinary study, and galvanizing generations of alumni volunteers in support of the Harvard community. Nancy Beth, we're so grateful to you for all that you've done for Harvard and for Radcliffe. I am deeply honored and touched by the recognition that this medal bestows. And I want to thank President Bacow. I want to thank the members of the awards committee, my Radcliffe family, and everyone else who was a part of this process. It means a great deal to me. I was not a student government type at all. And I think that's one of the ways that my undergraduate experience transformed my life. It really led to me being the person that I am. I was elected president of the Radcliffe Union of Students. University Hall is a special place to me because as the president of the Radcliffe Union of Students, I sat on a couple of committees the only woman in the room, in this big room in University Hall, with all of the portraits of the men 
around the walls, <laughs> looking down at me, their Harvard presidents, and thinking to myself, what an experience. You know, that also is a memory <laughs> that you know will, will never leave me. Very different these days. The Harvard Alumni Association said that they wanted to add a second Radcliffe woman uh, appointee to their board. I was nominated and began then, and then I was invited to join the Radcliffe Board of Trustees. We worked very closely together, and the Radcliffe Institute was born. And I'm very proud of having helped to shape the future of Radcliffe and its mission. I've made really wonderful friendships. I've met extraordinary people. And that, I think, is what's been most rewarding. And it's been wonderful. If my parents were alive, they would be beaming. And it means that much to me as well. Preston N. Williams, esteemed scholar, beloved educator, and spiritual leader. For more than 50 years, you've tirelessly championed the cause of racial justice and expanded Harvard's diversity of scholarship, pushing the Divinity School and the university at large to center equity and inclusion as bedrock values, bridging opportunity gaps and increasing possibilities for all students and faculty. Congratulations, Preston, on pushing us to be even better than we thought possible. And thank you for all you've done for the university. I would like to thank the award committee for selecting me for this honor. I would thank the president for the bestowing of the honor upon me. And I would thank Dean David Hempton for his support of me and my work at the Divinity School. I was pleased to be appointed potent professor of theology and contemporary change and to be welcomed to the university by Emory Houghton, Ambassador Houghton. I was pleased also to receive the honor of the chair from President Pusey, who I admired because of his work in reviving religion at the school. President Bach and his assistant, Walter Leonard, asked me to help them in the establishment of the Du Bois Research Institute. I was pleased also by that. I'm also pleased to have had the opportunity to work with the African-American alumni, alumni of the school in relating the school to the churches and creating the Summer Leadership Institute, which serves in its 11 years about 400 pastors or laypersons who were working in economic and social development in the urban communities of America. Finally, I guess I would simply say I'm proud also to receive this medal. Congratulations to our 2021 Harvard medalists. Thank you to these six extraordinary medalists for their faithful and steadfast service to the university. Thank you, President Bacow and congratulations to all the Harvard medalists celebrated today. For the past year, members and alumni of the Radcliffe Choral Society met virtually each month, building a strong connection and source of support between these groups of women. Together, they recorded the Radcliffe alma mater. Today, to honor the contributions of Radcliffe College and its alumni, and to mark the historical significance for men and women alike, we share with you, Radcliffe now, we rise to greet thee.
So much has happened at Harvard since 1636, it's almost impossible to be first anymore. But today I congratulate all of you, and especially our new members and our reunion classes, on being the first alumni to attend an annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association online. It's a dubious distinction, but here we are, more than 400,000 alumni strong in almost every country on the planet and every continent save Antarctica. Well, actually, my guess is that if we looked really hard, we'd probably find a Harvard-trained scientist even down there. Those who made this gathering possible for us could not have dreamed it. I think of John Quincy Adams bemoaning foul and stormy weather as he and his contemporaries met for the first time to contemplate a Harvard made stronger by her sons and eventually her daughters. For those people gathered in a circuit court chamber in Boston, this Harvard, our Harvard, was unimaginable. Yet we have them to thank for envisioning a future in which the graduates of the university support her aspirations and guide her carefully and wisely into great uncertainty. In every age, we've succeeded in that work. And this age is no different. When the pandemic spread around the globe and swallowed almost all of what we know, knew as normal, you rose to meet the challenge of the day, eager to help this community in whatever ways you could. Your creat creativity, your urgency, your resolve were unmatched. When our students found themselves back at home, some with poor internet connections or no spaces to call their own, you were there with the wherewithal to provide bandwidth and workspace, making it possible for your successors to succeed. When our teaching hospitals found themselves in short supply of critical personal protective equipment, you were there with connections and resources that put tons, literally tons, of gloves, gowns, masks, and shields into the hands of people caring for the most vulnerable among us. And when our institution found itself in the midst of one of the most severe financial challenges since the Great Depression, you were there with record-breaking support, the most current used gifts we've ever received in a single year. This, of course, all happened as you were doing the phenomenal work that you usually do for Harvard tens of thousands of admissions interviews, countless connections with new graduates seeking jobs, and millions of hours of service in causes and communities that are literally helping to repair our world. I have never, ever been prouder to be part of our great university, and I have never, ever been more convinced of the power of higher education. The pandemic has underscored that we can do more when we do it together, be it as alumni or as institutions. And I'm deeply committed to preserving and strengthening connections between and among Harvard and the world's great colleges and universities. For the past year, I've watched with awe as members of our community and partners throughout the region, across the United States and around the world have worked to meet the challenges of the pandemic, to speed progress towards freedoms that so many of us once took for granted. Two of the vaccines now in use, Johnson & Johnson and Moderna, had their origins in Harvard labs. We have people working on the front lines and saving lives as they change the landscapes of medicine with science in a state of near constant evolution. We have people seeking to understand how humanity has responded to and coped with the disease from newborn infants to elderly folks and everyone in between. And we have people reaching out to others across time and space, across difference, to find a way forward that can improve our lives in the process. There's perhaps no better example of this than the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, or MassCPR, a Harvard-based initiative that has taken on an outsized role in the fight against COVID-19. 
established at Harvard Medical School in March of last year, MassCPR has connected and supported hundreds of scientists and clinicians from Harvard, MIT, BU, Tufts, the University of Massachusetts, as well as local biomedical research institutes, biotech companies, and academic medical centers. They're joined by collaborator, collaborators at the Guangzhou Institute of Respiratory Health and Tsinghua University in China, and others from Germany, India, Italy, the list goes on. The goal is to get us out of this pandemic and better prepared for the next one. By now, we are all aware of the costs of a slow response to a global crisis. Preserving and protective lives and livelihoods around the world requires collaboration around the world. We now have all the tools we need to be anywhere at any time. The work ahead requires a recommitment to creating and strengthening the bonds of admiration and aspiration that make international teamwork possible. I look forward with hope to what our university will contribute to that effort. Harvard has taught me so much throughout my life, but it's been throughout this year, in the midst of incredible pain and suffering, that I've learned something about the institution that only calamity could reveal. We, the living embodiments of this special place, guide the university carefully and wisely into uncertainty through our actions. Harvard is the work we share throughout the world. Harvard is our best effort, even at our worst moment. We are Harvard together, through calm and through storm. And we are working, alumni and friends, students, faculty, researchers and staff, to address the greatest challenges facing humanity. When we meet next year, the pandemic will, I hope with lots of hard work and a bit of luck, be behind us. But climate change will still be with us. Inequality will still be with us. Injustice will still be with us. In each of these areas, and as in so many others, Harvard is advancing knowledge and speeding progress with unmatched creativity, urgency, and resolve. I'm honored to be here today to mark the passing of an extraordinary year with all of you. My thanks again to President John West for his leadership of this august body. And my thanks as well to Kevin Young, Harvard College Class of 1992, and the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture for joining us today and for being our inaugural online speaker. Thank you all again for being here, such as here is. To each and every one of you, thank you and Godspeed. Hello, it's an honor today to speak to you all as part of the Harvard Alumni Association annual meeting. Harvard has been instrumental in shaping me and my work as a poet, as the director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and indeed as a kind of accidental, or should I say lyrical, historian. I became a poet while at Harvard, or perhaps there I first became comfortable with the label. I've been writing poems well before then, since I was 12 or so, though it wasn't till I was away at school that I learned to print letterpress and to edit, to visit and love archives and use bookstores, to craft stories and poems, and to accept them as my own. But it was Louisiana, where both my parents are from, that birthed my work. Those rainy for front porches are where I came to understand that poetry was not the ethereal or the effervescent, but the mud and red dirt, a homemade elegance. The poems I began writing in college and that formed my senior thesis that ended up becoming my first book, Most Way Home, were ones in which family was ever present, whether as my dedication read, blood adopted, imagined, or all three. Family took up residence in my poems as ancestors and ghosts, speaking to and through me it felt at times. No wonder my second book was called To Repel Ghosts. 
There was rather a whiplash effect being in Cambridge, though, as I was quickly disavowed of the notion that everyone, or sometimes it felt anyone, had grown up as I had. The child of parents were the first generation to go to college. Southern University, an HBCU or historically black college where they met. This meant several things. One, that we ate like immigrants from an African-American South without shame, but with pride. Uh, and I tease my mother, who herself is now a Harvard alumni listening in, shout out to Dr. Azzy Young. Uh, I tease her that we ate okra for each meal. It also meant that my folks emphasized education as a great equalizer. One reason we might say it is too often denied. And that I emerged from an all black context, not just in Louisiana, but also in Boston and Chicago where we'd lived, almost anywhere I'd lived in our moving about the nation, in each locale, a place where I had cousins and play cousins, the support of community and family, church folk and barbershop talk, food and music and familiarity. Getting to college, they had food or what passed for food, yet little else was familiar in the trappings of the place. But I soon found the joy of those who felt like me, haunting the non-existent hallways of Canada D, who met at rallies or parties and then had our own. We marched, we danced, often in that order. I threw parties where I was the non-resident DJ and became a DJ on the radio station playing alternate alternative R&B, a phrase that one wishes would have stuck in the culture, describing the ways I was free to play James Brown's Funky Drummer, or Chuck Brown's Go-Go, or Public Enemy, or The Poor Righteous Teachers, or De La Soul, or Kung Fu Hip Hop Heads, The Fooshnikins, where I had permission to be brown and black and anything I wanted, a voice. So I had music and meaning, the things that helped me see what poetry could be. I also had some terrific teachers, including poets Lucy Brock Broido and soon-to-be Nobel laureate Seamus Heaney, whom I would continue to know and later be responsible for part of his archive as a curator. I learned early the ways that the black country life I was writing about was one not unfamiliar to Heaney, at least in terms of the country or poetry. Indeed, that the high head okra and sky high yearning that I was writing about could be found in a different form in his death of a naturalist or north or the poems from seeing things he'd read to us in Adam's house. These were also things I saw in the Louisiana where I went home to see. What I wanted to see was a world in which myth and my grandparents, their lives and beliefs and storying could not only belong, but be a song. I began to write things that felt as present as the world around me, only more so. I wanted, at least on the page, a context assumed black, in which the protagonist, often rendered as you, was black too. Being black by default is still both unusual and radical in a world whose newspapers, at least then, only identified the race of black people or people of color. What of a blackness that wasn't a blank, but didn't have to announce itself, not because it was ashamed, but because it was assumed? I found literary ancestors who'd felt the same way, almost accidentally. Langston Hughes and Gwendolyn Brooks, I later learned both had lived in Topeka, Kansas, where I had grown up in part, and they spoke of race in the way they spoke of reality and fantasy. Blackness was both a given and something sought. It was a home and a departure. This is a poem called The Preserving. Uh, from that first book, Most Way Home. And it a woman uh, who is something like my mother, um, is remembering, some, somewhat like my mother, is remembering uh, a childhood. The Preserving. Summer meant peeling. Peaches, pears, July, all carved up. August was a tomato dropped in boiling water, my skin coming right off and peas, Lord, after shelling all summer, if I never saw those green fingers again, it would be too soon. We'd also make wine, gather up those peach scraps, put them in jars, and let them turn. Trick was enough air. Eating something boiled each meal, my hair in coils by June 1st, 
Mama could barely reel me in from the red clay long enough to wrap my hair with string. So tight, I couldn't think. But that was far easier to take care of. It lasted all summer, like Ashenese. One Thanksgiving, while saying grace, we heard what sounded like a gunshot, ran to the back porch to see peach glass everywhere. Reckon someone didn't give the jar enough room to breathe. The only good thing about them saving days was knowing they'd be over, that by Christmas, afternoons turned to cakes. Coconut yesterday, fruit cake today, fresh kashaw pie to start tomorrow. On Jesus' day, we'd go house to house, tasting each family's peach brandy. You know you could stand only so much a taste Time we weaved back, it had grown cold as war. Huddling home, clutching each other in our handed down hand-me-downs. We felt we was dying like a late fire. We prayed those homemade spirits would warm most way home. The search was key. At Harvard, I read Toni Morrison for the first time and heard her lecture and read from Beloved. I took classes with black professors like civil rights giant Julian Bond and Nathan Huggins, who died during our class on race and pseudoscience, and Carol Livia Haran, who taught me to teach and also how to be. Her class on black male writers, we quickly and honorifically named Rap after Professor Haran announced on the first day that she was leaving after that semester and was teaching hip-hop alongside Richard Wright and the other writers she had filled the syllabus with. More even than those official writers with the permission she gave us. I remember lectures on Roxanne, Roxanne as an epic cycle and the pu visits of Public Enemy and Queen Latifah who signed the Black Literary Magazine I'd helped to revive. After founding another magazine my freshman year, a friend and I had relaunched Diaspora, the Journal of Black Art and Culture, and filled it with poems, stories, and essays of those we knew and those we got to know. I met the future author Colson Whitehead and we became friends. We shared a style and a love of comics and bad movies and good words and so-so seafood. The journal published interviews with Angela Davis and assumed that music and food and talk were all part of the epic that we were making called blackness. We were lucky that we found ourselves at the center of something we can look on, back on now and say was part of what some have called our current black renaissance. Members of our masthead went on to earn two Pulitzer Prizes, those are both Colson's, and one was a Pulitzer finalist in drama, two MacArthur Genius Grants, and even an Oscar. And that's just from the first issue, an issue I had Queen Latifah's sign that's still on my shelf. We held readings, and even an office in Adam's house where I lived, we hung out, we argued, we listened. We made things, including friends, and many of us still are. I say all this to say that in my experience, if community is not around, it must be found or founded. African American studies uh, was long from its current revival, so we were our own ad hoc black studies program. Like the Dark Room Collective, which I joined around that same time, 30 odd years ago, we knew that blackness was everywhere. And as they say, everything. Which is not to say it was the only thing, but it was in our music, our dancing, our talk, our luck. Like the Dark Room's motto, ours might have been, total life is what we want. Not that campus was always welcoming. Going to college in Boston was alienating and strange at times, and then there were the racist things folks would yell at you from passing cars. Once a month or so, I had to escape to Mattapan, taking the red line to the end to see my Aunt Lydia and Uncle Alvin to get some good food and talk. I had become an English major by default, too, almost uh, I had become an English major by default, too, almost, as African American Studies, one of the first black studies departments in the nation, had only one faculty member left. I had to find my way on my own, becoming an autodidact, self-taught though I was in school, with my junior paper later becoming the Colonel of the Grey Album, my book about the blackness of blackness. I had also begun a project that took over 20 years, the poems that eventually became Ardency, a chronicle of the Amistad rebels. It was a book that I both had to write and knew I couldn't yet. 
one that told of our founding shame of slavery, about an incident I first heard of by reading the Amistad's letters in a book in Harvard Bookstore, my other classroom. I was shocked I hadn't even heard of the case, much less been taught it, especially because for me, it wasn't hard to imagine the cold that, as they later put it, catches us all the time, that the rebels thrown in New Haven jails must have felt taught English and converted to theology by students from some school there. I was a cold I had come to know, though I had survived the blizzard of 78 in my snow pants. It was a cold no coat could cure. What must it have meant to be enslaved in a nation that claimed freedom? What must it have meant to have been a farmer who had then to take up arms against one's captors and then to have promised to have to return to America, as they called it, the Amistads, in order to get home to all you've known. All we want is make us free, they wrote. Sinke, the leader of the rebellion, and his cohort more eloquent than imaginable in a language only now their own. Theirs was a map, one I already knew by instinct, but also had to learn to be as eloquent as they. In short, I became a lyrical historian, too. This is from the last section of the book called Witness. It's from Ardency, and it's in the voice of a choir. This is Choir Evening. Sang, sang against the storm and through, sang the warm rain and the cold, and our voices growing hoarse with wind, no talk of heaven, though we learnt that too upon the ocean. Blood that isn't kin, no supper to sang for, nothing but ration. Heaven ain't the end. Heaven begins the steady lifting. Things I don't have no word for, bones lining the ocean floor. Hush, child, the rain, my voice all. I carried. What would I have thought then, had I known that the clan had burned a cross in the yard only 30 years before my time? Now, nearly 30 years after that, we still must say how recent that was, and ask how different was a cross from the racism of fellow white students who said aloud as African American studies began to rebuild, we simply couldn't lower our standards. Was the Klan part of the standards? Would I have been more upset knowing that it had happened or knowing that it hadn't been acknowledged? It would be the work of undergraduate reporters to free up this information recently, which I think important to mention if only to get past it. This is something I learned from the blues, to name pain in order to transcend it. It's how I view leadership, especially in a tumultuous time such as ours, one in which we all have to turn away from social media from time to time, one in which rest is revolutionary, one in which the things that have kept us apart are quite visible and literal. I wish to believe that we might transcend as well, but it requires admitting who we are and where we are. We are in need of a history reclaimed and fully explored, and of a lyrical leadership, that like a good poem does, makes unexpected connections, grows audiences, and allows meaning to emerge and also to soar. After all, ours is a precedented time. One thing I have learned by living in and leading archives and now museums is the way that not only are we living history and are living history, but that history speaks to the here and now, that we must listen to it and listen for it. We must speak with it and find in history a dance partner, one that, like a good poem, transcends nostalgia, but that understands it, one that keeps alive in memory things we didn't always understand or even know. The archive is alive. The museum and the university is made up of moments and memories, but also of silences that now speak. We must speak, too, and let the objects tell the whole story of the past centuries and our own, too often the story was and still is told as if there weren't silences, which hurts us all, especially hurting those whose stories and omissions commit many sins. 
It isn't that we didn't know of the Tulsa massacre a hundred years ago. It was that it was not enough told in our history by those who said only they could do the telling, with uprisings and massacres reduced to riots. The model of black history isn't simply recording, but testifying, in the legal and the religious sense, of being called and calling out, of witnessing, which isn't just seeing, but also saying. Such witnessing wins out. Now, the Tulsa massacre is the stuff of exhibits like our museums, testifying to destruction, but also resilience. Today, such facts can even inspire horror and fantasies like The Watchmen and Lovecraft Country or the beauty of Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad, instead of the other way around when, for too long, the facts of racial unrest and massacre were shaped or erased by fantasy or official denials. We must see, but also say. In doing so, we prepare not just the past, but ourselves for this moment. I see this in poetry, where black poets have long insisted on writing of the world and not just of nature, of writing about nature from a black perspective, of writing about whatever they want, being old and young and black and woman. Quote, being property once myself, Lucille Clifton writes, I have a feeling for it. That's why I can talk about environment. What wants to be a tree ought to be. He can be it. Or, as she puts in another poem, Surely I am able to write poems celebrating grass. And then later in that same poem she says, But why is there under that poem always an other poem? It is this other poem we must listen for, this deeper story, this further music. In the case of the museum, it is a music that governs the spheres of influence, a metaphor for the black culture that courses through our airwaves and internets, the African-American story at the heart of the American experience, the black people who have shaped the nation and made it a more perfect union. I am interested, as always, in the history of music and the music of history. What we can hope for is hope. I want to end with a poetic sequence, much of which takes part at Harvard, which also happens to talk about the history of music and black life there. Like the hip hop that inspires it, it is at times nostalgic, often elegiac, and celebrates the freedom I found there, but also mourns a loss of innocence and sometimes those loved ones, roommates, and others whom we've lost. It's called De La Soul is Dead, and it makes use of the interlinked sonnet sequence known as The Crown to explore the lessons that link us. De La Soul is dead. A roller skating jam named Saturdays. We were black then, not yet African American, so we danced every chance we could get. Thursday and Saturdays we'd chant, the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire, we don't need no water, and folks' perms began to turn. We had begun to dread or wear locks anyway, our temples we'd fade. We said, word, and death said, dang, and down, and fly. We gave no goodbyes, just, all right then, or bet. No one was dead yet. People Who Died, Jim Carroll Band. No one was dead yet. Not that some didn't try. Often friends of mine, these are people who died. Died. Weekends, drank too much, then broke into the pool and swam, though I was barely good at that. The bottom, I never did touch. Home almost dried, we listened to the dawn, or to Mr. Dabalina, Mr. Bob Dabalina. Glory, how a stupid, doused in eyeliner or lycra, and that was just the boys. Our favorite song was Noise. The Scenario The two of us, black, met one night, dancing alongside each other to tribe at a party in the world's smallest room. Someone from Carolina brought moonshine, and over the beat of the clanking heat, Philippe leaned over his date to say, Hey man, we should be friends. What you know, yo. And that was that. 
popping the caps off brown red striped bottles with his teeth he'd drink out the side of his mouth sly we heads kept ours dreaded crowned a decade later he was gone the scenario our favorite of 500 songs when you were mine nothing passed us by baby you're much too fast in 1990 we had us an early 80s party nostalgic already i dug out my best ops and two polos fluorescent worn simultaneously collar up pretend preppy when Blondie came on, Rapture, Be Pure, things really got going, and then the dancing got shut down by some square. What was sleep even for? Potholes in my lawn. This life. I confess we did look somewhat alike, Kenny and I, baby dreads, tortoise shells, tight fade. Though that night his giant white roommate drunk on eight ball in the pool room called out Kenny, Kenny, even when I said I'm not him, and he began cursing me out. Quit pretending. That was too much. Doppelgangers. Unblood brothers, we should have done more with it. Dressed as the other for Halloween chanced an evil twin movie. No dice. Instead, we danced. Side by side. Three is the magic number. Twins to the rhythm. We danced as one does to the remix of three is the magic number at a house party someone threw just because. We were black then, about to be African-American, so folks schoolhouse rocked and smurfed whenever we damn well pleased. We should have done more or believed mon frere, mine own body double. Given the campus cops the slip whenever they quizzed or frisked us for studying while black. Kenny, I hope you're somewhere far from here, dancing away trouble. All that I got is you. Radio edit. Play it again. Soon all will be gone. The places I've known, Elsie's, the tasty, Tommy's lunch, replaced by lobster and prefix brunch. The cobbler one day disappears like the very word, cobbler. My dry cleanser now does shoe repair. One potato, two potato, that druggist I never went to, slowly. Every bookstore, shut down or moved, Star, McIntyre and Moore, put out like lights. After 180 years, we're closing our doors. Even the worst house, its food earning its name, I miss avoiding, proving yourself no more a tourist. If lucky, we leave not just a place, but a name. Soon all gone, Tommy's, the tasty, Elsie's, me. The last day of our acquaintance. How late it would get. Every party was an after party. Some nights we'd even let ourselves forget that dawn would soon come. I do not want what I haven't got. Mostly it did. Sometimes the morn was met less alone, her beauty and scent, her buzzed head numbing your arm. Once you start, how can you quit all this remembering? We make love like memories, if lucky and not too late. The choice is yours. Too late. The silence ours now sounds like the second when the music stops. Not for good, but for a breath or two. Engine, engine, number nine on the New York transit line. If my train jumps off the track and now we're back up. Oh, how high we jump. Reaching for the sky. Hurricane purple and a night mostly black. Dark blue. Red. Nobody, nobody was dead yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young, for joining the annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association. No Harvard gathering, virtual or in person, would be complete without the singing of our school anthem. Please join me in enjoying the work of the Harvard Chorus and Harvard Band in their rendition of Fair Harvard. Fair Harvard, we join in thy jubilee throne, and with blessings serve it.
and to the By these festival rites from the age that is past to the age that is waiting before. O relic and tie of our ancestors' work, that has long kept their memory warm. First flower of their wilderness, star of their night, come rising through change and through storm. Fair-hearted, we join in thy jubilee throng, and with blessings surrender thee all. By these festival rites from the age that is past to the age that is waiting before. O relic and time of our ancestors' worth that has long kept their memory warm. First flower On behalf of the Harvard Alumni Association, let me once again welcome the Harvard Class of 2021 to our alumni ranks and thank our university leadership, volunteers, and alumni for all you do on behalf of your fellow alumni and our one community. I look forward to reconvening in person in Harvard Yard in 2022. I now hereby declare the 151st annual meeting of the Harvard Alumni Association adjourned.
We love to say that it's a small world, but if there's anything that these past four years have shown me, it is that it is such a humongous world. Never did I imagine that coming from New Orleans to Harvard, I would travel to Argentina and China, just to name a few. And so this has truly shown me that my time at Harvard is just the beginning of all the places I will go and all that I will do. The virtual environment has forced us to find new ways to engage with classmates who wouldn't have participated otherwise. For unions to me, reconnecting with old friends and finding new ones. And I certainly hope you're having a wonderful day today. I do think the thing that people say about Harvard being about the people is very true. Um, it's about the people that you meet, the people that you interact with, and, and the people that you learn from. I've gotten to learn so much from my peers. I've gotten to have the best of memories with my friends from Harvard, and I can't wait to come back. The one thing about the Happy Committee is, is that you can't choose the family that you're born into, but you can choose the family you want to be with. And the Happy Committee is like a one large family. So in my personal family, in my public family, Harvard matters to me tremendously. This moment of recognition is a moment of hope. And it always gives me a sense that things are going to be better because the people at Harvard who are graduating are going to make it better. Veritas. I came to Harvard not knowing a single person here. And the fact that I've built such a big family around me, from my teammates to just people I've met in the dining hall in Annenberg, um, my house community, it's crazy to think that it's been four years since I started this journey. I think that the most beautiful thing for me is to see all the young people coming along and all the honorands coming through. In addition to seeing old friends, I always make new ones, and I'm looking forward to meeting many of the people I've become friends with through our online discussions. Which is farewell, be thy destinies onward and bright. To my children thy lessons still give, with freedom to think and with patience to bear, and for right ever bravely to live. I wish you very well on your commencement and congratulate you and look forward on another occasion to being there with my top hat and welcoming you to an actual commencement.